Robert, it's great to have you here for the Vector Space Talks. I don't know if you're familiar with some of this fun stuff that we do here, but we get to talk with all kinds of experts like yourself on what they're doing when it comes to the vector space and how you've overcome challenges, how you're working on, through things, because this is a very new field and it is not the most intuitive, as you will tell us more mm. in this upcoming talk. I really am excited because you've been a scientist by trade. Now you're currently founder at Emergent Methods, and you've dedicated your career to a variety of open source projects that range from the large scale AI systems to the discrete element modeling. Now at Emergent Methods, you are adaptively modeling over 1 million news articles per day. That sounds like a whole lot of news articles. And you've been talking and working through production grade RAG, which is basically everyone's favorite topic these days. So I know you got to talk for us, man. I'm going to hand it over to you. I'll bring up your screen right now. And when someone wants to answer or ask a question, feel free to throw it in the chat and I'll jump out at Robert and stop him if needed. So sure. great to have you here, man. I'm excited for this one. Thanks for having me, Dimitrios. Uh, yeah, this it's a great opportunity. Um, I love talking about vector spaces, parameter spaces. It's uh, <laughs> so to to talk on the on the show is great. Um, we've got a lot of fun challenges ahead of us in the industry, I think. And uh, the industry is establishing best practices. Like you said, everybody's just trying to figure out what's going on. And some of these base layer tools like Quadrant uh, really enable products and enable companies and and they enable us. So let, let me start. Um, yeah, I, like you said, I'm Robert and uh, I'm a founder of Emergent Methods. We, uh, our background, like you said, we are really committed to free and open source software. Um, uh, we started with a lot of narrow AI. Um, Freak AI was one of our original projects, which is AI ML for algo trading, uh, very narrow AI. But um, you know, we came together and, and built Floatapt. It's it's a it's a really nice cluster orchestration uh, software, and we'll, I'll talk a little a bit about that during this presentation. But some of our background goes into like like you said, large scale deep learning for supercomputers. Really cool, interesting stuff. Um, we have some cloud experience. We really like configuration. So let's let's dive into it. Uh, you know, why do we actually need to engineer context in the news? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of reasons why news is important and why it needs to be distributed in in a way that's <laughs> um, balanced and diversified, uh, but you know also consumable, right? Let me, let, let's let's look at ChatGPT on the left. This is ChatGPT plus. Um, it's kind of hanging out, searching for Gaza news on Bing, trying to find the top three articles. Um, you know, it, it's live web search is powerful, but it's slow and ultimately inaccurate. And so what we're building is real time indexing and we couldn't do that without Quadrant. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of reasons which I'll, I'm, I'll be perfectly happy to dive into. But eventually ChatGPT will pull something together here. Oh, there it is. Um, and, you know, the first thing it reports is a 25 day old article with 25 day old news, old news. So it's just inaccurate. So uh, it's, it's borderline dangerous what's happening here, right? So this is a very, very delicate topic, uh, engineering context and news properly, which takes a lot of energy, a lot of time and dedication and focus. And not every company really has this, this sort of um, resource. So, you know, we're talking about enforcing journalistic standards, right? Uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT, they just don't have the time and energy to build a dedicated prompt for this sort of thing. So it's fine. They're, they're doing great stuff. They're helping you code, but uh, someone needs to step in and, and really do enforce some journalistic standards here. Um, and that, that includes enforcing diversity, languages, uh, regions, and sources. You know, if I'm going to read about Gaza, what's happening over there, you can bet I want to know what Egypt is saying and what France is saying. And, you know, what Algeria is saying. So 
you know, let's do this right. That, that's kind of what we're suggesting. Uh, and the only way to do that is to parse a lot of articles. That's how you avoid outdated stale reporting. And that's, that's a real danger, which is kind of what we saw on that first slide. Um, no, everyone here knows hallucination is a problem and it's something you gotta minimize, especially when you're talking about the news. Uh, it's just a really high cost if you get it wrong. And so you, you need people dedicated to this. And if you're gonna dedicate a ton of resources and a ton of people, um, you might as well scale that properly. So that's kind of where, where this comes into. We call this context engineering, um, news context engineering to be precise. You know, before Llama 2, uh, which also is enabling products left and right, as we all know, uh, the traditional pipeline was, you know, chunk it up, take 512 tokens, put it through a translator, put it through distill Bart, uh, do some sentence extraction, and uh, maybe text classification if you're lucky, get some sent sentiment out of it. And, uh, you know, it works, it, it gets you something. But um, after, you know, we're talking about reading full articles, getting real rich context, um, flexible output, it, translating, summarizing, really deciding that custom extraction uh, on the fly as your product evolves, that's something that the traditional pipeline really just doesn't support, right? Um, we're talking being able to on the fly say, you know what, actually we wanna ask this very particular question of all articles and get this very particular field out. And we just, it's really just a prompt modification. So, um, you know, this all is based on having some very high quality base level diversified news. And so we'll talk a little bit more, but, um, you know, news catchers is, 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 an, is one of the sources that we're using, uh, which opens up 50,000 different sources. Um, so, you know, check them out. That's newscatcherapi.com. Uh, they even give free access to to researchers if you're in, if you're doing research in this. So, you know, I don't want to dive too much into the 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 direct rag stuff. You know, can, we can go deep, um, but I'm happy to talk about some examples of how to optimize this and how we've optimized it. Um, you know, here on the right, you can see the diagram where we're trying to follow along the, the process of summarizing and embedding. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, it's here to support. Uh, you know, after we've summarized those articles and we're ready to embed, that embedding is really, it's really important to get that right. Because like, we, like the name of the show suggests, you, you have to have a clean cluster uh, vector space if you're going to be doing any sort of um, really rich semantic similarity searches um, it, it, and if you're going to be able to dive deep into extracting uh, important facts out of all 1 million articles a day you're going to need to do this right so you know having uh, a user query which is not equivalent to the embedded page where this is the data the enriched uh, uh, data that in the embedding that we really want to be able to do search on and then how do we connect the dots here? Of course, there are many ways to go about it. Um, one way, which is interesting and fun to talk about, is is um, high DE. So that's you know uh, basically a hypothetical um, document embedding. And what you do is you use the LLM directly uh, to generate a, a fake article, and that's what we're showing here on the right. So now uh, let's say if the user says what's going on in New York City government, well you could you could say hey write me just a hypothetical summary based it could it's completely fake and and use that to create a fake embedding page and use that for the search right so then you're getting a lot closer to where you want to go um you know there's some limitations to this to high de there's it's there's a computational cost um also it's not it's not updated it's based on whatever um you you know, it's, it's basically diving into what it knows about the New York City government and just creating keywords for you. So, you know, there, there's definitely optimizations here as well. When you talk about ambigu ambiguity, well, what if the user follows up and says, well, why did they change the rules? Of course, that's where you can start, you know, prompt engineering a little bit more and saying, okay, given this historic conversation and the current question, uh, Give me some explicit question without amb ambiguity, and then you know do the high DE if that's something you want to do. The real goal here is to stay in a single parameter space, a single vector space, 
um, at, at, say as close as possible when you're doing your search as when you do your, your embedding. So, you know, we're, we're talking here about production scale of stuff. So I, I really am happy to geek out about the stack, the open source stack that we're, that we're relying on, which includes Quadrant here. But let's start with VLLM. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it. This is a really, really um, great new project. And they're focused on continuous batching and page detention. And if I'm being completely honest with you, it's, it's really a, a, above my pay grade in the technicals and how they're actually implementing all of that inside the GPU memory. But what I do, what we do is we outsource that to that project and uh, we really like what they're doing and we've seen really good results. It's in, in increasing throughput. So, you know, when you're talking about trying to parse through a million articles, um, you, you're gonna need a lot of throughput. The, next, the other is text embedding in inference. This is a great server. And, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of vector databases will say, okay, we'll do all the embedding for you and we'll do all the, the everything. But we, when you move to production scale, I'll talk a bit about this later, it's really, you need to be using microservice service architecture. So it's not super smart to, be, to, to have your database bogged down with doing hand, sorting out the embeddings and sorting out other things. So honestly, I'm, I'm a real big fan of single responsibility principle. And that's what TE, TEI does for you. And it also does dynamic batching, which is great in this world where everything is heterogeneous lengths of, uh, of what's coming in and what's going out. So uh, it's great. It, it really simplifies the process and allows you to isolate resources. But now, you know, the star of the show, Quadrant, um, you know, it's, it's really uh, come into its own. Um, anyone riding the quadrant rate wave is, is just reaping benefits. It seems monthly, you know, like two months ago, sparse vector support got added. Every, there's just constantly new massive features that enable products. Right. Um, so for us, yeah, we're doing so much upsert. We, we really need to minimize client connections and networking overhead. So you got that batch upsert. The filters are huge. You know, we're, we're talking about real time filtering. You know, we can't be searching on news articles from a month ago, two months ago, if the user is asking for a question that's related to the last 24 hours. So uh, having, having that timestamp filtering and having it be efficient, which is what it is in, in Quadrant, is huge. Uh, keyword filtering is, is really opens up a, a massive realm of oper product opportunities for us. And then the sparse vectors, you know, we, we hopped on this train immediately and are just seeing benefits. Um, you know, I don't want to say say replacement of, of Elasticsearch, but well, Elasticsearch is, is using sparse vectors as well. So you can add Splade into Elasticsearch and um, Splade's great. It's a really great uh, alternative to BM25. It's based on that BERT architecture and that's that really opens up a lot of opportunities for um, filtering out uh, keywords that are kind of useless to the search when the user set, uses the and a and um, then the, there, these words that are less important. Splade's a bit of a hybrid into semantics, but sparse, um, sparse retrieval. So it's really, really, really interesting. And then the idea of hybrid search with semantic and a sparse vector uh, also it, it opens up the, the ability to do you know, uh, ranking and it, it, it's it's just um, you got a higher quality product at the end, which is really the goal, right? Especially in production. Um, you know, point number four here, I would say, is probably the one of the most important to us, where because we're dealing in, in a world where latency is king, and uh, being able to deploy Quadrant inside of a, the same cluster as all the other services. So we're just talking through the through the switch. That's huge. Uh, you know, we're never getting bogged down by network. We're never worried about uh, a cloud provider potentially getting overloaded or noisy neighbor problems, stuff like that, completely removed. Uh, and then you got high privacy, right? All the data is completely isolated from, from the external world. So this sort this num point number four, I'd say, is one of the biggest value adds for us. Um, but then, you know, distributing deployment is huge. Uh, because high availability is, is important and deep storage, which when you're in the business of news archival, and that's one of our main missions here is archiving the news forever. Um, that, that's an ever-growing 
um, uh, database. And so you need a database that's going to be able to grow with you as you, as your data grows. So what's the TLDR to this context engineering? Well, service orchestration is on, it's really just based on service orchestration in a very heterogeneous and parallel event-driven environment. You know, on the right side, we've got the user requests coming in. They're hitting all the same services, which every, you know, every five minutes or every two minutes, whatever you've scheduled the, the scrape workflow on, also hitting the same services. This, this uh, requires some, some orchestration. Um, so that's kind of where I want to move into discussing the real production, scaling, orchestration of the system and how we're doing that. Provide some diagrams to, to, to demonstrate, to, to show exactly why we're using the tools we're using. Here, you know, uh, uh, this is a, an overview of, of our Kubernetes cluster with the services that we're using. So it's, it's a bit of a repaint of that, of the previous diagram, but a better overview about uh, showing kind of how these things are connected and why they're connected. Um, you know, and I, I'll go through one by one on these services to, to just give a little deeper dive into, into each one. But the goal here is for us, in our opinion, microservice orchestration is key. Um, sticking to single responsibility principle, open source projects like Quadrant, like TEI, like VLLM, and Kubernetes, it's huge. Kubernetes is, you know, opening up doors for security and for latency. And, and of course, if you're going to be getting involved in this, in this game, you got to find the strong DevOps. So <laughs> there's no, de there's no, there's no escaping that. Um, so, you know, let's step through kind of piece by piece and um, talk about FlowDAP. So that, that's our project. That's our open source project. Uh, we've, we've spent about two years building this for our needs. And we're really excited because we, we, we did a public open sourcing uh, maybe last week or the week before. So um, finally, after all of our testing and rewrites and refactors, we're open. We're open for business and it's running asknews.app right now. And we're really excited for where it's going to go and how it's going to, you know, help other people uh, orchestrate their clusters. Uh, our goal and our priorities were you know, highly parallelized compute, and run it, we were running tests using all sorts of different executors, comparing them. So when you use FloatApt, you can choose Ray or Dask, and that's key, especially with vanilla Python, zero code changes. You don't need to know how Ray or Dask works in the back end. Floatapt is vanilla Python. That was a key goal for us to, to ensure that we're optimizing how data is moving around the cluster. Automatic resource management. You know, this is a bit, this, this goes back to Ray and Dask. They're helping manage the resources of the cluster, allocating a GPU to a task or allocating multiple tasks to one GPU. These, these can come in very, very handy when you're dealing with very heterogeneous workloads, like the ones that we discussed in those previous slides. Um, for us, the, the biggest priority was ensuring rapid, proto, pra, rapid prototyping and, and debugging locally. Um, when you're dealing with clusters of 10, 15 servers, 40 or 50, 100 with Ray, honestly, Ray just scales as far as you want. So when you're dealing with that, that big of a cluster, it's really imperative that what you see on your laptop is also what you, um, are going to see once you deploy and, 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 and being able to debug a lot of anything you see in the, in the cluster is big. Um, for us, there's, we really found the need for easy cluster wide data sharing methods between tasks. So uh, essentially what we've done is, is made it very easy to get and put values. And so, um, you know, this, this, this makes it extremely easy to move data and share data between tasks and, um, make it highly available and st stay in cluster memory or persist it to to um, to disk so that you know when you when you do the inevitable version update or debug you're 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 get you're reloading from uh, from persistent from a persisted state um, you know in the real time new, news business scheduling is huge uh, scheduling making sure that uh, various workflows are scheduled at different points in uh, different uh, periods and or frequencies rather and that they're uh, being scheduled correctly and that they're triggered, their triggers are triggering the, exactly what you need when you need it, uh, huge for real time. And then one of, one of our biggest uh, 
selling points, if you will, for this project is Kubernetes style everything. You know, our goal is everything's cube, Kubernetes style, uh, so that you know if you're coming from Kubernetes, everything's familiar, everything's resource oriented. We even have our own, you know, flow ectl, uh, which would be the cube cube ectl uh, style command schemas. You know, a lot of what we've done is is ensuring deployment cycle efficiency here. So it's the goal is that Flowdapt can schedule everything and manage all these surfaces for you, create workflows. Um, but you know, which why these services for this particular use case? I'll kind of skip through quickly. I know I'm kind of running out of time here, but um, of course you're going to need some some proprietary remote models. That's just how it works. Um, you're going to, of course, share that load with on-premise LLMs to reduce cost and um, to have some reasoning in, reasoning in engine on-premise. But um, there's obviously pro advantages and disadvantages to these. You know, I'm not going to go through them. I'm happy to make these slides available, and you're welcome to kind of uh, parse through the details. Um, yeah, for, for sure, you need to start thinking about persistence and search and making sure your those services are robust. That's where Quadrant comes into play. Um, and we found that the all-in-one solutions kind of sacrifice performance for convenience or sacrifice ac accuracy for convenience, but it's just, um, it really wasn't for us. We'd rather just orchestrate it ourselves and let Quadrant do what Quadrant does instead of kind of just hope that uh, an all-in-one solution is handling it for us. Um, and that allows for modularity performance and you know we'll we'll dump quadrant if we want to probably we won't or we'll dump minio if we need to or we'll swap out for whatever replaces vllm you know trying to keep things modular so that future engineers are um able to to adapt with with uh, the, the 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 tech that's just blowing up and exploding right now right um you know, the last thing to talk about here in a production scale environment is really minimizing the latency. I touched on this with Kubernetes, ensuring that you know, these services are sitting in the same uh, on the same network, and um, that is huge. Uh, but that 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 talks about the communication latency. But when you start talking about getting hit with a ton of traffic, production scale, tons of people asking for asking a question all simultaneously, and you needing to go hit of a variety of services. Well, you know, this is where you really need to isolate that to an async environment, it's asynchronous environment. And um, of course, if you could write this all in Golang, that's probably going to be your best bet. Um, for us, we we have some of some services written in Golang, but predominantly, especially the endpoints that are that the uh, the ML engineers need to uh, work with, we're we're using fast API. Uh, on Pydantic, and honestly, it's, it's powerful. Pydantic uh, v2, v2.0 now runs on Rust, and uh, as anyone in the Quadrant community knows, Rust is really valuable when you're dealing with um, uh, highly parallelized environments that require high security and protections for for immutability and atomic atomic atomicity. <laughs> yeah, forgive me for for the for pronunciation. Um, you know that kind of sums up the the production scale uh, talk, and I'm happy to to answer questions. You know, I, I love diving into this sort of stuff. Um, you know, I, I I do have some just general thoughts on why startups are so much more uh, uh, well positioned right now than some of these uh, incumbents, and I'll just do a kind of a quick run through, less than a minute, just to kind of get it out there. We can talk about it, see if we agree or disagree, but. You, know, you you touched on it, Demetrios, in the first uh, first in the introduction, which was uh, the best practices have not been established. That's it, and and that's that really that is why we, uh, startups are, are have such a big big advantage. And the reason they're not established is because well, um, the, the 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 new paradigm of technology is just underexplored. You don't really know what what the limits are and how how to properly handle these things, um, and that's huge. Meanwhile, some of these incumbents they're they're dealing with all sorts of limitations and resistance to change and stuff. And um, yeah, I mean, you, and then just you know market expectations for for incumbents maintaining these kind of legacy products and. and Trying to keep them hobbling along on this old tech, um, 
you know, in my opinion, startups reason, you got your reasoning engine, building everything around a reasoning engine, using that reasoning engine for every aspect of your system to really open up the adaptivity of your product. Um, and okay, I won't put Elasticsearch in, in the incumbent world. I'll keep Elasticsearch on this in the middle. I understand it is still has a lot of value, but some of these, you know, vendor lock-ins we're not not a huge fan of but anyway that's it that's that's kind of what i all i have to say but i'm happy to take questions or chat a bit um yeah, yeah. Let me... dude i've got so much to ask you and thank you for breaking down that stack that is like the exact type of talk that i love to see because you open the kimono full on and i was just playing around with asknews.app and so i think it's probably worth me sharing my screen just to show everybody what sure. exactly that is and how that looks uh, at the moment. So you should be able to see it now, right? And mm -hmm. super cool props to you for what you've built because I went and intuitively I was able to say like, oh, cool, I can change. I can see like positive news and mm -hmm. I can go by the region that I'm looking at. I wanna make sure that I'm checking out all the stuff in Europe or all the stuff in America categories. I can look at sports, blah, blah, blah. Like as if you were flipping the old newspaper and you could go to the sports yeah. section or the finance section. And then you, you cite the sources and you see like, Oh, what's the trend in the coverage here? What kind of coverage are we getting? Where are we at in the coverage cycle? Probably something mm -hmm. like that. And then wait, <laughs> Although I was on the like happy news, I thought, and <laughs> yeah, that's a good murder. She wrote. So, <laughs> so anyway, what we do is we actually sort it uh, from, we, we, we take the poll and we actually just sort most positive to the least positive, but oh, you're right. I, I was talking, we were talking the other day. We're like, let's just only show the, the positive, but yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> there you go. Murder. She wrote, <laughs> but the one thing that I was actually literally just yesterday talking to someone about was how you update things inside of your vector database. So I mm. can imagine that news, as you mentioned, news cycles move very fast. And the news that happened two hours ago is very different. The understanding of what happened in a very big news event is very different two hours ago than it is right now. So how do you make sure that you're always pulling the most current and up-to-date information? Hmm. Uh, this, this is another lo logistical point that um, we think needs to get sorted properly. And, um, you know, this, there's, a, there's a few layers to it. So for us, as we're parsing that, that data coming in from Newscatcher, so Newscatcher is doing a good job of always feeding the latest buckets to us. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes one will be kind of, arrive uh, 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 but most generally speaking it's always the latest the latest news so we're taking five minute buckets and then with those buckets we're going through and doing all of our enrichment on that adding mm -hmm. it to a quadrant and that is the point where we use that timestamp filtering which is such an important mm -hmm. point so mm -hmm. in the metadata of quadrant we're using the range filter which is where you know we call that the timestamp filter but it's really a range filter and that helps so you know, when we're going back to update things, we're, we're, we're sorting and ensuring that we're filtering out only what we haven't seen. Okay. That makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't, basically you could generalize this to something like what I was talking to with people yesterday about, which was, Hey, I've got an HR policy that gets updated every other month or every quarter. And mm -hmm. I want to make sure that if my HR chatbot is telling people what their vacation policy is. It's pulling from the most recent HR mm -hmm. policy. So how do I make sure and do that? And how do I make sure that my vector database isn't like a landmine where it's pulling any information, but we don't necessarily have that control to be able to pull the correct information. And this comes down to that retrieval evaluation, which is such mm -hmm. a hot topic too. That's true. Um, no, I, I think that that's that's a key piece of the puzzle. Now, in that particular example, maybe you actually want to go in and start cleansing a bit mm -hmm. your your database just to make sure if it's really something you're never going to need again. You got to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, this is a piece I didn't add to the presentation, but it's it's tangential. Um, you know, you got to keep multiple databases, and you gotta you gotta be keep you know make, making sure to isolate 
resources and cleaning out a database, especially in real time. So ensuring that uh, your database is m representative of what you want to be searching on. And you know you can do this with collections too if you want, but we find um, there's sometimes a, a good opportunity to isolate resources in that sense. 100%. So another question that I had for you was, I noticed Mongo was in the stack. Mm -hmm. Why did you not just use the Mongo vector option? Is it because of what you were mentioning where it's like, yeah, you have these all-in-one options but you sacrifice that performance for the convenience um uh, we didn't test that to be honest um and so i can't I, I can't say all i know is um we tested weavy it we tested one other um and i just really like quadrant i really like i think um although I, you know i was going to say i like that it's written in rust although i believe mongo is also written in rust if, I, if i'm not mistaken um but for us, the document DB is more of um, a representation of of state and what's happening, and in, in especially for our configurations and workflows. And it's and meanwhile, we really like keeping and relying on Quadrant and all the features Quadrant is is updating. So yeah, I'd say single responsibility principle is is key to that. Um, but I I saw some chat in Quadrant Discord about this, which. I think the only way to use vector is actually to use their cloud offering, if I'm not mistaken. Do you know about this or? Yeah, I think so okay. too. I this think... would also be a, a, a piece that we couldn't do, so. Yeah, where it's like, it's open source, but not open source. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, this, this has been excellent, man. So I encourage anyone who is out there listening, check out, again, Thanks. this is asknews.app and stay up to date with the most relevant news in your area and what you like is there and i signed in so i'm nice. guessing that when i sign in i can it's going to tweak my settings am i going to be mm, able good to question catch this next time so well at the moment if you star on a, a story a narrative that you that you find interesting then you can filter on the star and whatever the latest updates are when you, you'll get it for that particular story. Um, oh, nice. Okay. Uh, it, it brings up another point about Quadrant, which is at the moment, we're not doing it yet, but we have plans to use the recommendation system for um, letting a user kind of create their profile by just saying what they like, what they don't like, mm -hmm. um, and then using the recommender to start recommending stories uh, that they may may or may not like and that's us outsourcing the quadrant almost entirely right it's just us building around it so that's nice yeah that makes life a lot easier mm -hmm. especially yeah. knowing recommender systems yeah well, that's excellent thanks Dude. i appreciate that um for sure and i'll try to make the slides available I'll, I, I don't know if, if i can send them to the to quadrant or something i could post yeah. them in the discord maybe for but, sure um, and we can post them in the link in the description of this talk so this has been excellent, Rob. I really appreciate you coming on here and chatting thanks. with me about this. And thanks for breaking down everything that you're doing. I also love the VLLM project. It's blowing up. It's cool to see so much usage and all the good stuff that you're doing with it. And uh, yeah, man, for anybody that wants to follow along on your journey, we'll drop a link to your LinkedIn so that they can connect thanks. with you. And cool. thank you. Thanks for having me, Demetrios. Talk to you oh, later. Catch you later, man. Take care.